as I've been telling you, we're going to have a different focus this Lent. We're not reading the lectionary lessons. We started on Ash Wednesday reading the temptation of Jesus in the desert, which is the traditional first Sunday of Lent. But we're going to focus on forgiveness this year. So I want you, before you hear any of the stories, to picture the person who really has hurt you or abused you or angered you or just treated you poorly, someone that you have struggled with letting go of the anger or the bitterness that has developed around that. We all have somebody. We all have somebody. Because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Maybe it's someone that you have forgiven, but it took a while in coming. Or maybe it's someone you work with who just irks the bejesus out of you every time they have a chance. Because it's always somebody, isn't it? We're reading this morning a different story, but one you all know. It comes from the 19th chapter of Luke, the first 10 verses. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's in your head. I just planted an earworm. I tried to get the youth to, to revisit, the, to bring the band back together. The old kids shout. They said no. But y'all know the song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee... Now you know it. Come on. A man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. And aren't the men glad that I didn't pick that for the prelude this morning? You have to, you have to sing that, because it'll be going through your head if not, because we tend to treat this as a children's story, I guess because Zacchaeus was short. But we really lose the meaning if we leave it at the song. But I was thinking back to a children's sermon that I preached years and years ago because the kid who was five in the story is now grown with children of his own. The last time he heard me say this, he said, when are you ever going to let this go? But it was great. I was preaching that morning on prevenient grace, John Wesley's understanding that grace comes to us before we're aware of it, before we have a chance to react, which is why John Wesley agreed that we should baptize infants. Then it's followed by justifying grace, the grace that saves us when we come to an understanding of what Christ has done for us, and sanctifying grace is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. But when you're preaching about prevenient grace and you're doing a children's sermon for little tiny people, you have to think about how to present the idea to them. So I asked them an age-old question that adults have wrestled with for years, but little children had never heard. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Half of them said chicken, and half of them said egg. And they started to sort of fuss between themselves. And one said, chickens come out of eggs. And the other one said, but chickens lay eggs. You can't have an egg without a chicken, and you can't have a chicken without an egg. They were all just, just going on about their business, fighting with each other. And Brendan raised his hand and sat there. They kept saying, I know the answer, Pastor Terry. I know the answer, Pastor Terry. I know the answer. I know the right answer. Five years old, the theologian and philosopher Brendan. I said, what's the answer? And he said, God laid the chicken, and the chicken laid the egg. <laughs> now, the idea of the Almighty on the nest is a strange one, <laughs> but he got it right, didn't he? God created the chicken, and the chicken then was able to lay the egg. There is a question about what comes first, isn't there? Does grace come before confession or contrition? Or is it repentance that brings about grace? That's 
a very heady question, isn't it? And one that this story that we just read about Zacchaeus answers. This is so not a story for children, although they like the song. Zacchaeus was a man who was short in stature, who was looked down upon physically, and if you have looked at the campaign going on, the political campaign, everybody, Republican and Democrat, is referring to how short Michael Bloomberg is. Not a very adult way to approach an election, is it? You can't vote for him, he's too short. Strange concept. So people in the town could look down upon Zacchaeus, literally. But that's not the way they were looking down upon him in the eyes of Jesus. They were looking down on him because he was what? Not just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. You have to understand, don't think IRS, and I know that's coming and people are starting to panic and get sweaty palms over that, but we're not talking about the IRS. We're thinking more mob boss, not a legitimate tax person, because in this time, the taxes he, were collect he was collecting were not for the Jewish people. They were from the Roman Empire. A Jew working with the Roman Empire would be seen as a traitor, a turncoat, an infidel, especially since he's collecting Roman coins. What did Roman coins bear on their surface? Caesar's image. And also the inscription that said, Son of the Most High God. Well, there you've already wiped out a couple of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no God before me. You shall make no graven image. And here they are carrying around this money that by definition rendered them unclean. So if you're collecting for Rome, the enemy of God's people, and you're going to be hated anyway, what was the typical response that a tax collector would have or a chief tax collector? They would skim a little bit off the top. Because if they're going to hate you for what you're doing, you might as well get a profit out of it too. So here is Zacchaeus, a man who has sinned against God and God's people, a man who is despised by his neighbors for the pain he has caused. Because you have to understand, these are people who are desperately poor and needy, and he's taking more than he is allowed, and the taxes were already high, to the point that if you paid your tax, you probably couldn't feed your family. He was despised. And Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way where? You can probably tell this is the 19th chapter of Luke. Where is Jesus heading? to Jerusalem. He's heading toward the time of his passion and his death. And he comes to this town and people have heard about him because word about him is spread and some of them are there because they think he's the son of God. Some of them are there because their children are sick and they have no other hope. Some of them are there just to see this novelty, this man they've heard about. We don't know why Zacchaeus wanted to look on him. Maybe he was feeling guilty. Maybe he was feeling some contrition. But we don't know that. But we know that he got there and the crowd had a good opportunity to throw him to the side. You know what it's like, don't you, to try to see a parade when everyone is in front of you? But there's something about Jesus that compels Zacchaeus to climb a tree. Again, not something a dignified Jewish man would do. If the priest's walking up to make sacrifice, if their robes moved in such a way that their ankles were seen, they had to go and make restitution for that. They had to make atonement for that because that was a sin. So in other words, if you're wearing a dress, gentlemen, don't climb a tree. But he has to see Jesus and he goes up the tree. And the most remarkable thing happens. And you have to picture the crowd this is a crowd. This is a mob scene. This is people jostling each other. But Jesus, in the midst of all that, looks up and sees Zacchaeus, sees him. And what else does he do? He calls him by name. Now, if somebody knows your name, what else do you think they know about you? They know who you are and probably what you've done. And he calls Zacchaeus by name. I cannot imagine why 
Jesus would see him there and call him. I'm sure Zacchaeus was like, he must be talking about another Zacchaeus, but he's looking at me. Which is why I asked the men's group this morning to sing, since Jesus came into my heart, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And also, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. And he calls Zacchaeus to come down, and he says to him, what? I must go to your house. You can't know what that meant to someone who knew full well how much he had disappointed God, who knew that what he was doing was absolutely wrong in the eyes of his community, of his temple, of the priesthood, of his God. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and yet he continued to do it. And here is Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the one who has come, Jesus, the one that they're saying may just be the Son of God or God incarnate in our midst. And he calls him by name and says, I'm going to your house. And what happens to the crowd? You know what happens when you keep company that's questionable. You become questionable yourselves. In one of the appointments I served years ago before coming here, it was Christmas Eve. And I looked up as people were coming in for the 11 p.m. service. The church was dark, lit by candles. And a man came in, and my heart leapt. He was someone I had met a few years before. But since I met him, he had been caught in a prostitution sting. He was a practicing attorney who turned state's evidence so he could keep his license. But his picture was in the newspaper. And the story of what he had done was written and well known around a rather small town. And I was doubly thrilled to see his wife and their grown children there. And I greeted him, and as I went to shake his hand, his hand was literally shaking. And I told him how good it was to see them. And then when the service ended, someone came to me and said, I saw you shaking hands with so-and-so. I bet if you knew what he had done, you wouldn't have let him in the church. I said, I know who he is, and I know what he's done. She said, well, I wonder who that woman was with him, because I heard his wife left him. I said, that was his wife. Those were their children. And she said, well, I cannot imagine letting someone like that into a place like this. Where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to go? When you know that what you have done has offended God and broken the heart of the woman that you love. Do you know how hard it was for them to walk into the church and they never came back because they were not greeted by anyone other than myself? But Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, knowing exactly who he is, exactly what he's done, exactly the level of depravity his life has gone into, and what does he do? He says, I'm coming home with you, boy. You need to come out of the tree and let me in. And Jesus doesn't care what the crowd says because nothing is going to stop him from being who he is and doing what he has to do because he says, let's read the last part again together, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. And if you want to sum up the gospel of Luke or the whole gospel of Jesus Christ in one line, for the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. We'll say it in other places. People who are well don't go to the doctor, do they? Now they do now because they got to get shots and stuff like that. But for the most part, hospitals are for those who are struggling with illness. And the church is not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. That's why the writer of Titus, traditionally thought to be Paul, but we're not exactly sure because of the wording and some of the phrasing and things like that that scholars look at. But he's saying when grace comes in Christ, what happens? Our lives are changed, our hearts are transformed, and we are abounding in good works. Zacchaeus' good works didn't save him. But coming face to face with his Savior, and not seeing judgment there, but seeing grace and love and acceptance 
and wholeness, shalom, offered to him by the very Son of God, changed his life. So what does this have to do with forgiveness? It has a lot to do with forgiveness. We can wait for people to get it right and come to us on their knees. Or we can understand that it is only by the cross and the sacrifice of Christ that we ourselves know redemption and new life. How, in light of that love, could we possibly withhold forgiveness from each other? How on earth or in heaven could we withhold forgiveness from each other? Mike asked me this week, what should we put on the sign out front? And I said, let's change it up a little bit now and then. But did anybody notice the sign out front, what it says this morning? Make Lent count. Make Lent count. Don't make this 40 days of going without chocolate or whatever little indulgence you like. If you feel closer to God by doing that, by all means do it. But make this Lent count by understanding that it is by grace that we have been forgiven. It is by grace alone that we have been saved. And that Christ calls us, commands us, to extend that grace to others in his name. So whether you're up the tree wondering why in the world Jesus loves you, or if you're in the crowd wondering why Jesus could love that other guy, May you remember his grace, and may it fill you, and may it transform you, and may it send you into the world to live that grace with others, through him and the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.